Hey everyone, how you doing today? This is class five, actually, of Audio MIDI One, spring 2022 semester. And I hope everybody was had a good couple of weeks. I didn't see you last week. Um, Thursday was a travel day, Friday, didn't get home till Sunday. And uh, back in my studio now, so you have a different background. You'll have better microphone and uh, audio better acoustics in the room, although I do miss the beach every morning because it's about 30 degrees up here in the Hudson Valley right now, um, and it was about 15 yesterday morning, very cold, but it'll get warmer soon enough. So how's everybody doing? Doing good. Good. Hanging in there. All right, great. I'm good. Good, good. Ah, this chat, this class is much more chatty than the... Uh, my recording studio fundamentals class. Um, okay, so we're going to continue on with, uh, I assigned something for last week. Where I asked you to watch two videos and then write me an essay. I'm going to read those and I'm not going to make feedback videos on those. I'm going to read those. I'm going to grade them. I'm going to make any comments, but I'll send them to you as an individual email instead of uploading feedback videos for that. So just so that you know what to expect. Um, we're going to continue on with the bar talk where we left off last week. But first, I wanted to do a little presentation about MIDI today. I mean, the class is Audio MIDI 1 and um, a little explanation as to what MIDI is and a demonstration uh, of one way to use it. I played Neptune Beach for my first graders today. I absolutely loved it. Oh, great. Yeah, and Neptune Beach has done re very well. I just released it on January 15th, and um, I've had a couple of radio interviews. I've got a radio interview set up for a week from Saturday uh, out in uh, a, a radio station in California, and I've gotten about 18,000 streams on Spotify already, so it's done very well. I've gotten radio airplay in England, uh, Ireland, Canada. It's... You know, I, I paid for some promotion with somebody I went to Queens College with. He runs a pr radio promotion group called Crossover Media. The guy who owns it, Max, he was a music student at Queens College when I was undergraduate. We were undergraduates together. And he's got an incredibly successful uh, radio promotion company. So I employed him for this. And that's another conversation that we'll have later on in the semester. So what is MIDI? Well, before we talk about MIDI, we have to go back to um, when synthesizers first became, I don't want to use the word popular, but when they first started being used to make music that actually sold recordings. And maybe the very first one was switched on Bach by Walter slash Wendy Carlos, uh, synthesizers were these big modular behemoths. And they were connected with, they were all controlled with voltage, right? Everything was analog. There was tr transistors, resistors, capacitors, oscillators, all, all these things. There's no, no ones and zeros, no digital information at all in these synthesizers. And the two main original competitors were on the East Coast, Bob Moog, and I've mentioned him before that he went to Queens College as an undergraduate in the 50s. He did take a few music classes with my professor, Professor Berkowitz, but uh, he went on, he was a, a physics major, I believe, and he went on to, Cor to Columbia, and then he got his doctorate in engineering, I believe, up at Cornell, and he went on to form Moog Music, and his synthesizers changed the course of popular and jazz music. So Moog, and then on the West Coast, there was a guy named Buchla, Don Buchla, B-U-C-H-L-A, and he created another kind of modular synthesis that had a different paradigm, and I don't know as much about that as I do about the Moogs, because I own Moogs. I've owned Moogs, and I've been playing Moogs since I was in high school. We had one, we had two in our high school, 
my high school, we had a, a little pra- piano practice room that was converted into a little ersatz music studio with two Moogs, a four-track tape recorder, uh, spring reverb, and an acoustic piano, and a turntable. And, uh, you know, I used to play around in there. Anyway, the way that you would... And I, I've, I, don't, I don't think I showed that video for this class. I typically do, but I showed it for Recording Studio Fundamentals. And maybe I'll show it in the future of this class. But the way that you changed sounds was that you had to take guitar, basically guitar cables and route what's called control voltage. And you used voltage to change the parameters of a circuit. So if you had an oscillator and you wanted to change the pitch, you would change you would change the voltage of that oscillator, which would cha- in turn change the pitch, and that's how things were communicated internally with um, something called control voltage. Now, control voltage has made a comeback over the last decade because modular synthesis, amongst a certain subset of the music world is incredibly popular now with things called Euro rack, where you can buy a a rack case and it has a standardized slot size. And there are hundreds and hundreds of manufacturers who make specialized um, modules that can fit in. And some of these modules are the size of a guitar pedal, right? They're very small, and you would still you would use cables. You wouldn't use the the big uh, like quarter inch guitar sized cables, but you use these mini jack cables, to, so that the, all these different modules can communicate with each other through control voltage. And I have instruments here that use control voltage. Uh, one of the instruments I'm going to demonstrate today uses it a little bit, but I have an ARP twenty six hundred over there, which you can't see uh, right now, that uses control voltage as well as having things hardwired. And I have an Oberheim synth and a couple of uh, newer Moogs that use control voltage. So it's a very, still a very useful protocol. But around 1980, around in the late 70s, the, the one thing about those kinds of synthesizers is that they were difficult to use live. Now, I don't know if you've ever seen, and let's see if I can, uh, let me just do something here. I should have had this up. So let's see. All right. So this this is Keith Emerson of Emerson Lake and Palmer. He's no longer with us. He committed suicide, believe it or not. It's really sad. But this is his modular rig right here, right? That's his Moog modular. And you notice that he's got all those guitar cables plugged into it. So what he would do when he would perform is that this Moog modular had eight oscillators. He would create six or seven sounds using that modular synthesizer. And then this modular synthesizer has a built-in mixer. And he would just turn up the volume of the oscillator that was set for the sound that he was using for a particular song. Now, that's a, that's a you know, kind of a cool way to jerry-rig not having any memory locations, presets, uh, but that's very inefficient, and it doesn't use the full capabilities of the instrument. So in, I forget exactly what year it was, but it was the mid to late 1970s, a guy named Dave Smith, who's still with us and making instruments, created something called the Prophet. And the Prophet had a computer chip in it, and it would store, it was an analog synthesizer that was all hardwired, kind of like the next Moog invention, which was the mini Moog. And I have one of those back here, this keyboard here. Um, It's not very well lit up, but that was a big change from the modular synthesizers in that all the basic routing was hardwired and you would have to just, and it was, the signal flowed basically from left to right. And then you would change the timbres just by twirling knobs, not by patching things in. So, 
that was really great because that was much easier to program. Still not easy, but easier to program in a live situation. And people like Chick Corea, George Duke, um, Jan Hammer, uh, they used these to compete with guitar players live because they were amplified and they could play. And then you could use the pitch bend wheel to do what a guitar player would do. And all these jazz fusion groups. Herbie Hancock used one, but Herbie Hancock was more invested in the ARP system. Um, he used a 2600 live, and he also used something called the ARP Odyssey live, uh, the bass line to uh, uh, Chameleon. Boom, 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 boom. That's played on an ARP. So these, these things started making their ways into music that was popular. Joseph Zawinul, Yosef Zawinul of Weather Report used two ARP 2600s live, and he was a genius at quickly programming things. Uh, but they wanted to have synthesizers that had a me memory that you could push a button and it would remember all. You'd set up a patch and you could push a button so that you could recall that sound the same way every time. And so Dave Smith of Sequential Circuits came out with a... F oh, the other thing, too, about the Moogs and the uh ARP, some of the and the ARP Odyssey is that they were all they they were all basically monophonic the, the Odyssey is duophonic you could play two notes paraphonically with it but for all intents and purposes it, it was a you mostly used as a monophonic synthesizer and so you know that became a little limiting when people wanted to start playing chords and do more or or orchestrating so then a guy named Tom Oberheim, and I have one of his, uh, yeah, one of his synthesizers, two of his synthesizers I have actually right now. He's a really amazing man. Um, he invented something called the, 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 the Eight Voice Pro, right? It started out as a, a, just a synthesizer expander module called an SEM. Then he put two of them together and it made the Two Voice Pro, and that's the one I have. And then he put six of them together and eventually eight of them together. And then... Lyle Mays from Pat Metheny's group and later Joe Zow Joseph Zawinul started making use of this because you could play chords and each, os each one of those SEMs, those synthesizer expander modules, could be programmed for a different sound. So that if you played a, if you had four, let's say you had four of them turned on, y you could play a four note chord and each note would be a different timbre, right? So you could play it orchestrally. But those had sort of a limited memory, but it was still, it was still a, a pain to program those. The Prophet was the first synthesizer that really had an integrated memory where you could just push a button and the sound that you program would come back up, right? So the big thing about all of this time was that they started getting away from control voltage, right? Because these, these instruments were hardwired. In other words, um, if we take a look here, there's, you know, there, there are just knobs on here that change the sound. This one here has a little area where you could do some uh, control voltage routing. It's, it's not extensive, but it's better than nothing. Um, but these are two relatively inexpensive keyboards. They'll help with today's demonstration. But basically, this has memory. So I could just push a button and it'll call up the same sound. These knobs won't move, but when you turn them, they'll change the, the sound, the parameter of the sound. And I'll go over some of that today because it'll, it, it will uh, eventually become useful in our class. So what happened around 1980 is that the major synthesizer manufacturers... And that would be Sequential Circuits, Oberheim, Roland, Yamaha. They started having a conversation about how they could update control voltage to 1980 so that these synthesizers that don't have control voltage built in could communicate with each other so that you could play one synthesizer and have it send out information that would control a second synthesizer or a third synthesizer or a drum machine. Or you could have a hardware sequencer play information and your synthesizers would play back. And this came out, this, they called it MIDI. 
MIDI stands for Musical Instrument Digital Interface. It's an acronym for that. And it revolutionized music of the time. I, as, as I graduated from Queens College in 1982, my undergraduate degree, and I was working in New York City at the original Little Shop of Horrors Off-Broadway show playing the synthesizer, the keyboard book. So it's electric piano, organ, and something called a, a Korg Poly 6 synthesizer. It was a six-voice paraphonic synth, and it had memory. So what was great about that was that we had the whole show set up so that uh, the, the first song was patch A1. The second song, the second, the end of that song was patch A2. The next song was patch A3. And you could just step through the entire song. And if sounds repeated, like let's say I did like a cheesy str string sound at the beginning and I needed it in song six, you could just copy it and maybe you'd be in bank C uh, patch four. You could just copy it there and you could just step through the entire show and reproduce the same sounds every night, right? It, it, it was really... Uh, really um, groundbreaking to do that kind of stuff back then. And then you started s seeing musicians playing out live with uh, some of them live playing along with pre-recorded sequences that they would have a drummer with a click track or get a feed and then the drummer would keep the time and the, the machines would play. Uh, I started getting involved with this in 1984 when MIDI came uh, uh, available and I purchased a DX7, which was the first popular, uh, it was one of the most popular synthesizers ever made. It featured FM synthesis, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, if we were live in, in, the, uh, in the college, we would actually talk more about it because we have uh, FM8 in, the, uh, in our, our IMAX in the college, so we could give a demonstration of that, but it'll just be a brief talk in a few classes from now. And I had a Juno 106, and I had a Yamaha drum machine, and and a four track, and I was able to make these, you know, these elaborate songs, and having MIDI control everything. So I'm just going to read a few things because I got some stuff written out here, and I just want to make sure I'm doing everything. Okay, so MIDI is an acronym that stands for Musical Digital Musical Instrument Digital Interface, right? So it's a way to connect devices that make and control sound, like synthesizers, samplers, computer, and even computers, so that they can communicate with each other using what's called MIDI messages. This lets one keyboard trigger sounds on another synthesizer, and it makes it possible to record music in a form that allows for easy note editing. So what we're doing in Pro Tools right now is using all of MIDI, um, the MIDI spec to to play sounds back, but it's doing it virtually without any cables hooked up. So, right, let me add Korg. They also were involved with that, uh, the formation of, uh, of MIDI. So, the big thing about MIDI is that it's based on the idea of message passing between devices. So, you have a keyboard and a synthesizer, and you'd like to record a keyboard synthesizer, you'd like to record a sequence using the sounds that are in that synthesizer. You can, so what, what you can do now is you can connect uh, the computer and the synthesizer together. You could record MIDI information into the computer. It spits it out. Now we're using mostly USB cables, and it makes the synthesizer place those notes back, right? So... There are several, there are two basic aspects of MIDI where something is an event and something is a series of events, right? So an event is when you push it down on the keyboard, if you play a note. A series of events is when you play something on the keyboard and, you know, there's wheels, uh, wheels on the side right? You move these wheels, that shoots out what's called MIDI CC. Now, you'll hear a lot of people say uh, continuous controllers. That's what that means. That's what's, that's what's used by people today, but the original spec for that is control change, right? 
MIDI CC. So that's the actual official meaning of, of MIDI CC. Okay, so other things is there's something called aftertouch. So let's say you push down on the keyboard and you push down a little bit harder. There's like a ribbon underneath the keyboard that senses how hard you're pushing and it can control, it can send uh, notes to create vib uh, messages to create vibrato or change the filter, filter value, all this stuff. So single events like note on, note off, note duration, or a series of events that sound like they're contiguous, but seriously, they're just a bunch of ones and zeros that are put together in a sequence, right? They just happen so fast that they sound contiguous. Now, the MIDI spec is based upon 16 channels and 127 values. Now, the 127 values is a little bit of a misnomer because... If you start at zero and you go to 127, that's 128 digits, right? It's just like the ticks. Uh, zero is the first tick and 959 is the last tick of a beat. But most MIDI sequences, most MIDI information starts at zero and it goes to 127. So it really comes off like there's 128. It's a little confusing, I know, but just, just, just there's 127 um, values in MIDI and that's just like ticks right if you if you if you have a if you have like something that's here and something that's here you have 127 subdivisions of that space but it's just messages so that let's say um, I was going to push this if this is all the way down that would be at zero and then as I move this up it would go all the way up to 127 right so there's only 127 uh, sp spots, even though on the analog world, there's, there's no s slots, right? There's, it's, it's just a continuous voltage change, right? But that gets transmitted into computer information. So th that's one thing. And so you have 16 MIDI channels, right? So what, what does that mean? Well, let's say that I had, um, Let's say I had something like this, right? This is called a beat step. This is a little hardware sequencer. And it had two MIDI channels. I could have a, a MIDI cable coming out of this, going into this compute, into this into this uh, synthesizer, and then a cable out of this synthesizer into this synthesizer. And from this, I could sequence two channels worth of two melodies. This would play one melody and this would play another melody. This would be set to MIDI channel one and this would be set to MIDI channel two. So you could have up to 16. This doesn't have 16 channels, but it's like a 16 lane highway, right? And so back in the day, and let me show you this photograph. Show and tell, it's my favorite thing. It's just a game we play. Uh, Okay, so this is a sloppy mess, but this is about 1998, and this is a room I had in a fairly low, uh, a post audio post production studio on West 49th Street, right in the corner of Eighth Avenue, and so I had a computer, right, and I had my main keyboard, and then these guys over here. This, these top three with the light on it, those are Kurzweil K2500 modules. And then below that, you can't see them. There are two Roland S760 modules. This is an organ. This is a Novation Supernova. And this is a Korg synth, which I can't remember the name of. I don't own that anymore. So basically, I would have a sequencer. I used something called Vision back then. And it, it's, it did the... Same type stuff that we're doing in Pro Tools now, except actually Studio Vision has some functionality that no other sequencer still doesn't have. Still, like right now, there's some sequencers that all. It had functionality that's not present in any modern day sequencer. It's just sad that it went out of business. So basically, I would um, play something in here and there's there was a serial port on this computer and that would go into 
something up here called a Studio 4. Right, and this is the Studio 4. So there would be um, a computer would get hooked into this bit right here. And then these right here, that's MIDI in and MIDI out. So this has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight MIDI in. Uh, yeah, MIDI in and eight MIDI out. And on each one of these MIDI ports, you could have 16 channels. So you could get with your hardware and this, you could get eight times 16 tracks of music, right? And this is the MIDI cable. It's a five pin DIN. These used to rule, rule my world. I still have a bunch of them. Um, yeah, and you take care of your stuff and it lasts a long time. That's another conversation. So basically, these five mo modules that are, um, these five modules that are in this rack here, each one of them was capable of playing 16 different timbres at once. MIDI channel one, MIDI channel two, MIDI channel three, so I could have, let's say, piano on MIDI channel one, bass on MIDI channel two, drums on MIDI channel three, strings on MIDI channel four, and, and so on and so on. Or if I was doing something orchestral, in the top one, maybe it's all my winds, in the middle one, it's my brass, and in the bottom one, it's my strings, right? And I could have, uh, uh, for winds, I could have piccolo, flutes, I could have alto flute, bass flute, I could have oboe, English horn, I could have uh, E-flat clarinet, clarinet, bass clarinet, I could have bassoon, contra bassoon, and, uh, you know, you know, you know, and, and each one of those would have its own channels, and that's called multi-tambral, meaning that this module can play back many sounds at once, and as a matter of fact, that, that, there are still instruments that are multi-tambral. My keyboard controller that I play on here I can layer several sounds at once and, you know, different sounds and it'll play them back. I can split the keyboard and have it controlled with different, uh, different spots of the keyboard be triggered by different MIDI channels. So th that still exists in like a lot of arranger keyboards. You can have like a whole arrangements being played out of a, a keyboard or a module. So that, 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 uh, still exists. So that's sort of the way that things were. And, you know, what really was a drag was, that to save what I was doing, I had to have these optical discs and this optical disc um, reader down here, and I would have to save every one of these instruments onto an optical disc and then load the sounds back in, and that would could take an hour and a half uh, for a full orchestral thing, as opposed to now. I can load up a sequence with, uh, you know, 30 or 40 or 50 gigs worth of samples. It takes a couple minutes, right? Um, yeah. So, I don't miss these days. Not at all. Although, I do wish I still had these two synthesizers. <laughs> um, but, you live and you learn. Yeah, and this little TV screen for the Roland synthesizers used to uh, be able to you hook up a mouse to it and then the all the parameters would be available on this screen up here. Oh yeah, those were the days. No, no acoustic treatment in that room, which is really bad. Okay. So let's take a look at a few things, right? So eventually my studio morphed to this, right? This is when I started using a, comp a second computer over here, but that was also, called, there was a PC running something called Giga Studio. And um, I also had this laptop to do virtual synths up here, but this, uh, no, actually, this is the Giga Studio over here, right? So this had six, 128 slots that I could load instruments into. It had, you know, I could get pretty sophisticated sounds, and, it, and but it all ran with MIDI cables hooked into it, into the computer. And uh, yeah, this is the same room. Still no acoustic treatment. I can't believe it. 
All right. So things evolve. So this is the way you guys are working right now. You've got your MIDI controller, whatever you're using. You've got a USB cable that goes into here, and you've got your DAW, which is we're using Pro Tools, but this could be any DAW. But MIDI is sent from the controller into the computer. And when you record and enable a track, that track receives the MIDI information that you're playing on this keyboard. And as of right now, you've just been doing on and off messages, you know, playing a note and then letting the note off. You haven't done any uh, control change or continuous controller stuff. Now, what I was doing when you on that picture that you just saw basically was I had my computer into that Studio 4 MIDI interface and then this is a module. I actually had one of these, a D110. And this is another module, right? And so this is this this is multi-timbral. You can play 16 parts on this. I'm not sure what how, if this is multi-timbral or not, this uh, Dave Smith thing. So on this, right, on this blue, the top blue cable, which is the same five-pin cable that I just showed you a second ago, you could send 16 MIDI channels to trigger 16 instruments on this. And the same on the second cable. So that would be 32 different instrument sounds you could get if this was also 16 voice uh, multi timbral. Let's see if there's anything else. Now, right. Okay, I'll show you this in a second. Now, we don't, I don't have this on my keyboards, right? But before we had those MIDI interfaces, the way that we would get this stuff to work would be the back of your synthesizers would have something that looked like this with MIDI in, MIDI through, and MIDI out. So let's say I had what we're going to show, the demonstration I'm going to do now would be MIDI out from. MIDI out from this instrument to MIDI in of this instrument. That's what I'm going to demonstrate in a minute. So then the blue instrument would send out note value changes that would trigger and control the gray synthesizer. Now, if you had a little hardware sequencer, like a, a Roland uh, MC50 or a Yamaha QX7, you could hook up... Um, a MIDI cable out of that into your first synthesizer. Then you could take MIDI through and hook that into your second synthesizer. Then MIDI through from your second synthesizer into your third synthesizer, etc., etc. So what happens is that if you MIDI in and MIDI out, if you play something and send it into here, if you take MIDI out, it will play that thing back. Let's say you send MIDI channel one, you're playing something, and it goes into here. If you take MIDI out and hook it into a second synthesizer, they will play the same notes. Let's say you have something coming in that's into the input that's MIDI channel one and MIDI channel two. You would go to MIDI through, and you would hook it up to the second keyboard, and it would play the second MIDI channel. It would not play the first MIDI channel. So, and you would have to set up the second synthesizer to receive on MIDI channel two. So this synthesizer would be set up to receive MIDI channel one, but it would pass all the MIDI information besides that, all the MIDI information through here. <clears throat> and then if your second synthesizer was set to MIDI channel 2, it would only listen to those messages that were coming in on MIDI channel two and not be affected by any of the other MIDI channels. So that's uh, before they had those MIDI interfaces. All right, so let's see this in action. All right, give me one second here. All right, so my voice is gonna be a little bit softer because I'm not facing into the microphone. So I've got this set up to play a sound. Right? All 
I have this set up to play a sound. I have hooked up MIDI out, right, from here, uh, here, going to MIDI in over here. And that's the same kind of cable as the one I showed you before. Let's see, I can show you, get that really close uh, there. It's a little out of focus still, but you can see it's got five little pins in a horseshoe shape and a notch, and that's how you know how to plug it in. I do this typically live at the college, but this is actually not so bad. All right, so if I turn the volume of this one off and I play this... I'm going to turn the volume on this one off, right? So you're not hearing anything. I'm going to turn the volume of this one on. And I'm just changing the filter. Now let's turn the volume of the first one up, the blue one here, black and blue one. So that's just this one here, and now I'm adding the second one in. So I'm changing octaves there by pushing these little buttons here, the up octave up and down, right? So that's a little trick. And if I turn the volume on this off, right, that also is being played by this, right? So if I turn the volume on this off, you get nothing. So when I change octaves, and then now the other thing that this transmits is pitch bend, which is this wheel here. This instrument that's playing, right? So I turn the volume on that down, you don't hear anything. Now, uh, let me just see something. Okay, let me just see if this transmits mod wheel. Um, I don't know how advanced these are. Yeah, it does. Let me just skip it. Okay, so I'm going to... Like, if I play this one, right, it's not doing that. But if I move this mod wheel while I'm playing this one, right, this is sending mod wheel information to control this instrument. So it's not just notes. This is what I'm talking about with control change or continuous controllers. And that... Th now, now if I turn the volume off on this and I play this and I turn the volume... This keyboard is on, but there's nothing, right? Because in order to get this to control this instrument, this would have to have MIDI output plugged into the MIDI input of this, but this instrument does not have a MIDI output. It's a very inexpensive synth. So it's a one-way communication under this circumstance. In order to make it two-way, you would have to have at least two MIDI ports in the back here, MIDI in and MIDI out. You would take MIDI out from this one back into this one, and then you could have two-way communication. But the way that this is set up now is it's one-way communication. So, um, yeah. Let me see if I've got anything else that I had prepared for this little presentation.
Yeah. Now, how does that relate to what we're... Hold on a second. Let me... Uh, So how does that relate to, and let me mute those synthesizers so I don't have any extraneous noise, to what we're doing? Well, these guys here, this is all done, this is, these are, you know, hardwired, right? These synthesizers are analog. They've got control voltages, they've got oscillators, they've got filters that are made up of, you know, transistors, resistors, capacitors. But they also have a computer chip in them. And that computer chip is taking all that, just some of that information, right? Note on, note off, pitch bend, and mod wheel. And it's transmitting it and affecting the sound of this instrument. None of the other knobs transmit MIDI functionality. If I take an instrument like this, um, hold on a sec. If I take an instrument like this, which is called the Moog Siren, every one of these knobs transmits MIDI information. And sometimes I leave this on my desktop and I have it hooked up with a USB cable to the computer and I can twist these knobs on a virtual synthesizer and get the feel like I'm twisting knobs on these, these instruments, you know, so I can, I can in real time... Um, You know, I can change the sound in real time, like like a, you know, like an instrumentalist would playing an acoustic instrument. Uh, that's really part of a big part of synthesis is having hands on and being able to change sounds. Uh, I do have a video on my YouTube channel where I show how to use the Siren to control software synths. And it, it, it's, uh, it's, re it's really cool. And, I, and it's small enough that I can set it up in two minutes and use it when I need to. All right, so any questions on that? That's an introduction. That's not everything you need to know. But I will tell you this, that MIDI is everywhere in the music in industry. Not just inside the computer, but if you go to see a live show, good chance the light show is being run by MIDI. If you go to see like Madonna, right, when she would tour, there was a guy named Michael McKnight, who I'm friends with on Facebook. I don't really know him, but he's very well known. He would be down under the stage with a couple of computers running a digital performer, and he would be controlling all of the stuff that the band couldn't play and the lights from his computer all using MIDI, right? So it's, 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 it's used all the time. If you're a guitar player, you can have a pedal board set up with MIDI patch changing, right? You can change the, the, the sound on your effects. If your effects have memories on uh, memory, any kind of memory locations on it, you can set up, you can have, um, a, a switcher that you can step through and let's say you're doing a song and it needs a long echo. Well, that you can have that into slot one of the echo bop, uh, pedal and then you can tap on something and it'll go to one. You tap on it again, it'll go to patch two and that might be a short slap delay because you're doing a 50s cover of an Elvis tune. And so those are all done by MIDI uh, patch changes. Um so it's a very, still a very robust platform, even though it's 40, almost 40 years old. And they are going to be doing MIDI 2.0 at some point in the future, which will have greater resolution because you have more powerful computers now. And we're still using the spec from 1984, right? So that's, it's, it's, it's interesting. All right. Any questions? Would the light show sit on a grid like in our DAW? Yeah, Adrian, I don't really know the answer to that, um, how that works, because I've never actually watched it, you know? You should probably 
could probably Google that and find that out. I just know that a lot of light shows are run by MIDI in professional situations. So, all right. So let's see. Let's move on to our bar talk friend. Where's my mouse? Here we go. Let's switch to our screen. And let's open the tools of pros. Uh, sometimes I call it Ami Tools because Avid's such a horrible company. It's like they're run by amateurs. Okay, so I'm going to use Maxfield's um, track. We're going to move forward with the the bit we did last week and I'm actually going to want you to finish this for next week and because I want to do another piece and move forward with different I'm going to give you a little introduction to some stuff today but you won't have to do it for next week so the way I've got this set up right now is the piano tracks are on the top so I'm not going to use these. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to highlight both of these. So I'll click on this one here and let me uh, get my, oh, this is in the way here, isn't it? Hmm. All right. It's a little sloppy. I don't like that, but so it goes. Let's uh, give me a second to rehook my camera angle up there. All right, that's a little better. I can be a little bit good. You can see the mouse now. All right, so. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I've selected the top one by clicking here, and then I'm going to hold the shift key down and click on the second one. And what I want to do for these, this is just my own personal thing, is we're going to use these as almost like a sketch score, right? So back in the day, Hollywood composers would write on a sketch score on two or three lines, and then they would notate what instruments were playing what lines, right? Uh, David Raxon, uh, a vast majority of Hollywood composers. As a matter of fact, in the 40s, 50s, 60s, and through the 70s, the only composers that I know that didn't do a sketch score were Bernard Herrmann and I believe some of John Williams' scores. But they would do a sketch score. They'd be very careful about, you know, who played what lines. They'd write it in, and then they'd hand it to an orchestrator who'd do the orchestrations. And that's sort of the technique that I'm uh, doing here. So I don't want I want to don't want to use these. So the first thing I want to do is I'm going to uncolor them. So I'm just going to click on this, the color palette. And then over here on the right, you have something called none. And then that becomes blacked out. Right? No color. And then I'm going to right click on the name. Both of these are selected, right? So if I right click on the name, a new menu comes down. And then you can just click right here to make inactive. Just like that. And you see how it becomes italicized and everything becomes grayed out. That means that this will not play, so you don't have to worry about it playing. And then what I want to do here is hold the Option key down and click right there, and they're not selected. So what I've done is I've made myself... Now, this to, to, to I can you know zoom in and out with this, right? So I'm holding the Control, the Option, and I'm doing Up to make it big, all the tracks bigger, and Down to make them smaller. Okay, great. And then, so what I did was I put in uh, 13 tracks, right? So just a chamber orchestra. You can do any any style of music you want. Undergraduate students that are doing your bar talk, you can, you can do any kind of sounds you want. We're going to be using just the 
uh, sounds that come with Pro Tools, and for right now it's Expand 2. Although, uh, if you go to the Spitfire website, Spitfire Audio, and I did put this in a uh, in the email, and you can download their... Um, the BBC Discover, right? It says $49 or free. You just go to free and you fill in the information and like a week later, they'll send you the uh, the code. They just want you to wait. And that's not an iPad. That's a Surface, I believe. Uh, and, you know, the, these are good for stu good for students. So I've got that loaded in for my strings. And this is what this the GUI for this looks like. It has very limited articulations. It's got long spiccato, piccato, and piccato and pizzicato and tremolo, but they sound better than the strings that are in Expand Two. The other sounds aren't are, are not bad. So I've just got a woodwind quint, a woodwind quartet, horn and trumpet, and a violin a string quintet, right? With with uh, violin one, violin two, viola, cello, and bass, and I've got it set up like an orchestra. Now I did, uh, I didn't talk to you guys, but I, I, you'll send me stuff, and part of my feedback to you will be how to order tracks. But what I will just tell you is that it all depends upon the style of music you're doing. But if I'm doing orchestral music, I'm setting it up like a score. Except for me personally, I typically put the trumpet above the horn because I like to have things by pitch. In, although in an orchestral score, the horn would be below the trumpet. I mean, the trumpet would be below the horn, excuse me. So that's the one caveat that I make. But just have your tracks organized. And notice that I've color-coded these tracks, right? And I've color-coded them by section. So my winds are all this purplish, my brass is this red, and my um, strings are this light green color, whatever that is. So... I want to orchestrate this, right? So it's very simple. So what we can do is, I'm going to, uh, well, first of all, I want to make sure that n nothing is selected here. So that's off. So I'm going to copy this, right? Just like this. Command C. And I'm going to go into grid mode here. And then I'm going to start off Now, I, I, you got to also think about the range, right? So I'm going to do this. I'm going to hit the return key, so I'm at measure one, and I'm going to merge paste. So that's option and the letter M like Mary. And the reason I merge paste is that you will notice that it says flute here, right? So if I just command V and paste it in there, it still says piano right here. So you can... Um, Option M, and it will take the name of the track. There'll be a little bit no of number after it. That's fine. So there's too much information here, right? Uh, so what I want to do is I'm going to do the same thing with the oboe and the clarinet. And then it's just a matter of listening. So I'm going to solo the flute, right? Now, Notice that that sounded weird. That sounded weird because some of these instruments are in mono and some of these instruments are in are polyphonic. And it's really weird because you're supposed to be able to control that with this here, but this is in mono and then they have polyphonic, but it doesn't seem like it works all the time correctly, which it has in the past. So I'm not sure what the dealio is with that. So... I'm listening to that. So I'm not definitely, if I'm going to use that at the beginning, I'm not going to use that bottom note. I'm just going to use the top notes. So I go here and I'm going to get rid of these notes, just um, highlighting and deleting. Okay, now return. I don't like the first thing being the flute. So I'm going to just. I'm going to delete that. And then right here, I'm going to unsolo that. I'm going to go to the oboe. I'm just going to click right here 
to go to the oboe. Well, actually, let me go back to the uh, this this MIDI editor here, so we're seeing it in the way I want you to work. So I've got the flute selected here, and then I'm going to go over here, and I'm just going to click on oboe, and then click on flute to get rid of it. And then the same thing with the oboe. You want to get rid of some of these low notes, right? So what if I did this? I had the oboe play the first bit and then the flute play the second bit. So then we'll have something like this. Oh, hold on. Let me solo. Let's, let's do this. Let me get rid of the clarinet. I can paste that back in later. So if we start from the beginning, we're going to hear the oboe... Right? Okay, great. So what do I want the clarinet to do? Let me paste the, that bit back in to the clarinet track. Merge, paste. And what I might do with the clarinet is have it play on the first bit. Whoops, sorry. Delete that and just have it play the low notes, right? Now... One thing about this, right, I mentioned this to some of you guys in your feedback, is when you've got, I'm going to solo this so you can hear this. If you've got like these samples, what I like to do is just leave a little space there. It just, it just helps, it just helps it, right? Because these are not such great samples. But um, now we can listen to this bit. Okay, so you're listening, and what I want you to get into the habit of doing is mixing while you work. And for where we are right now, mixing means one of two, two things, volume and panning, all right? So for, at first, we're going to do our work with just using velocity and at the end of the class, by the end of the class today, I'm going to show you how to do some automation of vo basic volume automation. All right. So listen to this, and you've got the flute is the melody, and the clarinet is the accompaniment. How is the balance? What should the focus be? Right. The clarinet is what? Too soft or too loud? You can type it in. You don't have to open your mic. I'll play it one more time. Correct. Too loud? Correct. Yep. So we can do that very quickly, right? So let me just zoom in so you can see this. I can use the selector tool and just click like that. Go to the grabber. And if I hold the um, command key down, see how that changes to a uh, like a sideways trimmer? You can just click and drag that down like that. So that's pretty quick, right? So let's listen to that now. Even more, right? Might be too much. So like, you know, it takes, a, you guys will get used to this pretty quickly, I believe. I, I believe. Great. And then... Let me think about this for a second. So if we look at this bit here, what I think I'm going to do is I'm going to copy this and merge paste it into here. And maybe the oboe will play the um, this bit. Right? And let's make a little space between those repeated notes. So we'll go to slip mode and just, just trim them off a little bit. Now with better samples, you might not have to do that, but I find that that works really well with, with expand too. It makes it sound a little bit better. And then uh, the clarinet, we're not going to have anything. So instead of opening up the MIDI editor, you can work it here. So I'm just going to click right here and get rid of, highlight that, and then hit the delete key. Uh, oops, I'm sorry, not the return key, the delete key. 
And that just, we don't need to have that, right? So let's take a listen now to our first two, couple of, first me- couple of measures. Okay, so in this one, the oboe, uh, those are too loud over here. So I'm just going to select these and I can just... So I made this one a little bit too short this time, right? So I'm just adjusting as I go along and I'm listening. Right? And then now we need a bass line. So our bass line is here. So what I'm going to do is... I'm going to copy this much, right? And I'm going to merge paste that, hit return, merge paste that into the oboe. I mean the bassoon. I don't need that. Now, what I want you guys to also do is if you feel up to it, you can take some liberties, you can add some extra notes. If you wanted to make this as a tune with a rhythm section, you could you, I, just be free. You don't have to do what I'm doing here, which is a, you know, just a straight orchestration. Just experiment around if you feel like doing that, right? Uh, and be, use your creativity. As long as you can sell it to me, I'm happy with that. I've I've sped up the tempo on this. I've I've done stuff with, I've added percussion, timpanis, and cymbals, and all sorts of stuff, and bells, which... You know, as I'm going along, I may decide to add that, and uh, I'd have to add those tracks in and and do that. So, um, what the first liberty I'm going to take here is I'm going to open up my bassoon track, and I'm going to make this note longer. Okay, so that's a tiny bit too loud, so I'm just going to click and drag all the way down everything here, right? So I just put put the um, the trimmer tool, notice the direction of the trimmer tool now, I get into the, lane, the editing lane, and it shifts, and I can just click and drag down, and you see how many MIDI values right there. And then this note can be softer because what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to copy this bit here and the first note here. And then I'm going to merge paste that in with the clarinet. Uh, Let's get rid of this. I put it in the wrong spot. See that? But it's easy to fix, right? I made it come in a beat too early. So I can just click and just drag that over like that. And now it's in the right spot. And notice I've done a little overlapping here, which is something I would do in regular orchestration. And this is, again, a little too loud, so we're just going to bring that down. And I'm going to do the same thing with this. I'm going to make this, fill this note out here and then bring this down here. Right? You could see that I'm filling out this orchestration rather quickly. Right? It's pretty, it's pretty, it's not, there's no, there's no magic. You've done so much work on the piano tracks that you don't have to do a lot of editing of note lengths. You don't have to do a lot of editing of velocities. You could just do this copying and pasting. And this is not the way I work all the time. Sometimes I work like this, but you're learning a lot of skills by doing this, right? You're learning how to copy and paste, how to edit, uh, how to how to edit in the e- edit, the arrange page, and also in the MIDI editor at the same time, going back and forth, and you're adjusting velocities to to mix things. Now, the next thing I want to do is everything is panned in the middle, right? So, I want to create a little sound stage, right? And I'm just gonna make something up where um, here we go. So panning, this is how I want you to pan. For MIDI instruments, I don't want you to touch this. 
at all for panning or for audio volume. As a matter of fact, you don't even have to see that for this in the next assignment. You can just deselect it, right? If you want, that's fine. This is where we're going to do our pan work and our initial, we're going to eventually do volume, but we're going to use, uh, um, I'm going to explain that in a minute. So I'm going to pan this, just do a little quick panning. I'm going to do the flute to the left, the oboe not as far to the left, the clarinet to the right, not as far to the right, and the bassoon further to the right, right? So and I'm using the numbers here. So I'm doing 40, 20, 20, and 40. And now I'll play this back, and you should hear some panning. Right, so you can hear the flute is over in the left. Uh, that's over here. Right, the oboe is in the left, but not as far. The clarinet's in the right. And the bassoon is further right. Right? Now, the next liberty I'm going to take for myself personally is, this is too slow for me. I think it's boring. So I'm going to make sure I'm back at measure one. And I'm going to click right here on the plus sign right here, and it's add tempo change. So I'll double click on that, and it opens up this window here. And I'm going to make this, let's make it 108 and hear what that sounds like. Okay, that's too fast, right? So it's a matter of playing around with it. Let's try 96. Great. Okay, so... Now, I, let's, let me orchestrate this a little bit more, right? I'm going to change my grid to eighth notes. And I'm going to select these notes here, right, in the bassoon. I'm going to copy those. And I'm going to merge paste them into the horn track. Okay, so I'm going to make these a little bit softer. Right, so you can tell that the horn's there, but it doesn't overtake the bassoon. I'm making the choice to make the bassoon my focus and have the horn layer in so much that it makes it, just enough that it makes it full. So let me play the bassoon solo. Let me add the horn this time. Let me turn the velocity on the horn up, and that this would be too much. Right? It becomes about the horn and not just, we're just adding a little bit of color with the, uh, French, with the French horn. Now, these are things that you, you don't normally think about when you're orchestrating assignments until you actually hear the performance. And then you're telling people play a little softer, a little louder, unless you're Ravel, unless you're Bartok, unless you're Stravinsky, and then you've got it all in your head. You know exactly how loud every instrument should be and your dynamic notations are so detailed that it, it, it you know, you only need a little bit of adjustment um, at the rehearsals if the players are good. But this, this is a teaching tool also because we are learning to be sensitive when you're making what I call aggregate sounds. A perfect example of an aggregate sound when I was studying with Professor Musgrave as a graduate student at Queens College, my favorite thing is that she would call the combination of a flute and an oboe a flobo, right? So that's kind of an aggregate sound. I've got a bassoon and a French horn here. That's an aggregate sound, those two playing together. They are, you know, not the same sound, but when they play together, they create a different timbre. And that timbre 
you have to be sensitive enough to the relative balance between each one. Which one is going to be the more dominant? Are they going to be equal weighted? Or is one going to be a little bit more dominant and the other one being a little bit more supportive? And which one is that? I chose the bassoon because the line is the bassoon and where I've pasted in the French horn, it's a little fill between phrases. And I want to just emphasize that fill a little bit, right? So these are just logical uh, things that I think that you should start thinking about as you're doing this study. It will make it much more musical for you, you know? This is not just, uh, I mean, I, right now we're doing rote work and we're just learning some techniques, but, you know, we should just start right away with making music. I, that's why I don't use a textbook and go through things and make dry assignments because it's devoid of music making. What good is all the technique in the world if you don't know how to make music with it? You could play 500 notes, but like if you can't make somebody, if you can't play, if you can't play uh, four notes and make people feel something, what good of a musician are you? Really, you could play Rachmaninoff piano concertos, but if you can't play something Danny Boy and make somebody, you know, feel an emotion, you're only half, a, you're a technocratic automaton. <laughs> okay. Um, so let's move forward. Okay, so right here we've got the tr this clarinet, right? And I'm going to play around with this. Will it be the trumpet? So I'll merge, paste the trumpet there, and let's take a listen. Okay, so I'm going to take some liberties here, right? I don't like the... I'm going to pick these first four notes, and I'm going to do... Right, we didn't do this yet. So there's a way of changing the values of notes using event operations. And if you want to manually do it, you go to event and event operations, and then you can bring up the event operations window, right? What I typically do is some of these have a key command and some of these don't. So we're going to do transpose. So for transpose, it's option T. Key command you should know. Every um, sequencer has a key command to bring up quantize. So I'm going to bring those few notes up an octave just by typing in one. Then I hit enter once. And then you have to apply it, which means you, you can either click on this blue box or I just hit enter a second time. And I'm going to listen because it might be too high. Let me just see something here. So now, this is a cool thing to do. This is advanced, but this is Audio MIDI 1. We get advanced, right? I can take the clarinet right here, and you'll notice that both instruments are in the MIDI editor, and they're color-coded with the track. If you have them in here and they're not color-coded, there are some boxes over here that you just click on until you get them to be the color coding that they're supposed to be. All right. So what if I did this, right? I've got those selected and I'm going to do shift and the downward so that now we've got and then this up an octave. So I like that better. And I'm going to make the trumpet a little bit more um, a little bit more present, but not that high note, right? I'm, I don't want that to stick out. So I'm going to do something else here. I'm going to play around with adding a harmony. And I'm going to listen to this. Let's listen to that in context.
now I'm getting somewhere. So you see, like, I'm not doing an exact reproduction. I'm changing some notes. And I, I can do that, right? This is just, this, we're trying to be creative. Now, let me tell you something. When you're doing a passage like this, right, if I solo the trumpet, what I find sounds better for something like this where it's part of a texture is I'm going to circle this and I want to make that just one note, right? Instead of two notes, I want that to be one note. So I can circle this and there's something called heel separation. Oh, it doesn't work here for some reason. All right. If you do option shift and the number three, it will combine those two into one note. So let me zoom in on that so you can see it, right? It's all, there's two notes there. Option, shift, and the number three, and that's one note. And that becomes now a... And let's play that with the clarinet. I like that, right? So we're getting somewhere. So let's see where we are here. Great. So I think I am going to want to have some percussion. So I've got an extra instrument here and I'm going to drag that up and it's going to be between the horn and the violin. And I'm going to, um, I'm looking for Really? It doesn't have a Glock? Gotta be kidding me. No, that's bizarre. Let's see, does it, are there bells? Bells. Okay, let's see. Ah, glassy Glock. Did we have just a plain Glock? Rich, oh, here we go, Glockenspiel. All right, great. And then I want to name this. And I'm going to select those notes there, right? So that's at measure five. I'm going to go down on my Glock right at measure five. I'm going to merge paste that in. And I'm thinking, right? Let's see. All right. So do you not do? I'm going to copy this right here. And I'm going to go down to violin one and merge paste that in. And delete this and this and let's listen to that so far uh, I should really do this these notes too right And then right here, I'm going to copy this and add a little bit more emphasis. Having it in violin two. And now we need some drones and we need the rest of our bass line. So this is our bass line, the first part of our bass line. 
And so we're going to go down here and we're going to go to the cello and we're going to pop it into the cello. That might be a nice thing with the cello. And maybe we'll double that with the viola. Maybe it'll just be the viola. I'm going to copy this note here, and I'm going to go to the bass. I'm going to merge paste it in there, and I'm going to change the bass articulation to pizzicato. I've got it set up there, and then I'm going to transpose that down an octave. All right, so I'm going to do minus one. Oh, I'm going to go down. Whoops. Interesting, right? So how did I just do that, right? Let me show you. I'm going to undo that. I'm going to add some emphasis in the bass here. So I like that pitch, so I highlighted it, I hold the Option key down, click, and drag it to the beginning of the next measure. And then right here too, right? And then this, I'm going to, let's see, where, what else do I got? So I need my drone notes, so let me copy these. And we need to get our drone notes. So let's see. So those are now what about the volume balance with those drone notes? Too loud, too soft. Too loud. Correct. Good. You guys can hear it, right? You can hear it when you pay attention. It's not. It's not rocket science. I don't know if I like the way that speaks. So let me try copy highlighting that and transposing just that note down and listen. Listen to what it sounds like. Right. I also think that maybe that's. Um, I don't like the way that the, the notes rearticulate, so I'm going to take that and I'm going to option shift three up here or over here. Either one works. And maybe do the same thing here. Get rid of that one. Now, we, this, we don't have a bass line in there yet, so... So let's copy this. And then I'm going to copy that and put that in the base, and then I'm going to transpose that down probably two octaves, I think. So I'm going to hold the shift key. Good, but they're too hard, so I'm just going to bring the velocity down. So if I solo that, right, it's too, it's too hard. Nice. Er. <laughs> and I'm getting tired of these guys playing this. Let me think about this for a second. Let me just... Go back to the beginning and take a listen. And that's too loud. What if I brought drop that up an octave and make that softer? Mm -hmm. 
right? So I'm just merge pasting the left hand in there. And then what I'm going to do is uh, that's going to be the cello. So I'm going to get rid of the low note. And we got the bass here. So we're going to get rid of this, just delete, boom. And then this needs to go down. So hold the shift key. Let's see, I don't like that shortness there, so let's make this note longer, but not all the way, so we've got a little space for the phrase there. Now, if you're going to use the, the, the BBC Discover, that's recorded what's called a situ, right? They, the, the, the violins are on the left, the second violins, the violas, the cellos, and the bass. It's all, it's all panned for you, right? So that takes a little bit of the... Um, work away from you and it, it sounds better too so uh even if you know if you're going to continue on with this that's a great library to have it doesn't cost you anything and it's definitely an upgrade no matter what no matter what sequencer you use it works it works in pro tools logic cubase performer ableton um reaper garage band it works in everyone so if after the class is over you're going to switch to you're going to take these techniques and go to your own sequencer then you'll um, be able to use those. So let's see. To copy this, so I'm just highlighting this and this. So that starts at bar nine, beat two. So I'm, oh, you're not seeing that. Bar nine, beat two, right? I opened up the piano track and I just am copying these drone notes and they start at bar nine, beat two. So bar nine, and you'll notice that the uh, playback head is blinking right at the spot that you, and the cursor's here. So I'm going to go down to the viola and merge paste that in there. I'm going to delete that. I copied that, right? So look, I copied I copied this. I'm going to delete this and I'm going to put that in the horn. Oh, wrong spot. Now, I'm going to do this. I'm going to make this all one note. So I'm going to highlight all of that, and I'm going to do Option, Shift, and 3. Either, either one of these threes works. And now, at this point, <clears throat> we're going to go, you know, you could see, I could go through the whole piece and do this, right? And I could be done with it in, you know, if I wasn't talking and explaining it to you, I could probably do, I could probably orchestrate this in 40 minutes, the whole thing, and be done with it, right? But I'm trying to explain my choices to you and talk about some of these editing techniques. But I want to, you know, go through the piece and get as far as you can in a week. All right. If you can't, undergraduates, I'm going to, I'm going um, to send out an email in the morning. I, 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 I'm sorry, I'm a little behind with this, but uh, I'll figure out how many instruments for each piece. For graduate students, you can be, you know, this this is a, a good size ensemble. This is 13 instruments. Right. And you notice that I'm not playing all the instruments all the time. So there's a lot of space with some of these instruments and you just orchestrate it for that. And then the undergraduates with some of that simpler stuff, you know, it might be six instruments, but let me I'll send out an email with exact instructions. Undergraduates, I'm going to expect you to finish that and maybe make it twice as long, um, which uh, I'm going to show you how to let me show you how to do that. So real quick. So if I, let's say I wanted to make this piece twice as long, I would highlight all of these 
right? And then, so what I did was I, I uh, clicked, held the shift key down, clicked all the way there at the second key. So if I wanted to double this, and this is 26, 26 measures long, it, it would be uh, uh, command and the letter D. And that duplicates that all out. So I'm undergraduates with your bar talk, I may actually ask you to make it twice as long because it's only a few measures. Um, it's not that long a piece. So, yeah. Okay. So I will send out an email tomorrow with the exact instructions as to how long. But graduate students, you can figure it's going to be about this many instruments. Now, we're going to do another piece after this, and we're going to work on using those of, um, event operations to change, to, to quantize, to change note length, to change velocities. So that this, we did all this manually. So you got some mouse technique and you learned how to use some of the tools, but there's also other ways of changing and affecting notes. And that's one thing about sequencers is that there is, there are, multiple ways to accomplish the same feat. Multiple ways. And each situation is, I, I look at each situation as unique and I pick the technique that I think from experience will be the most beneficial to get the results I want. And that just takes experience and doing things. And the more you do this, the better you'll get at it. It's it's not a secret. It's not rocket scientist science. It's just like playing an instrument. The more you do this, the better you get at it, right? Uh, yeah, let me take a sip of water. All right, now. Um, let's talk about a couple of other things here. Now, that's all at one volume. Even though I he there's some work here, this particular instrument, like I'll play very soft, and then I'll play really hard, it's the same volume. The way you would change the volume on these instruments, and I'll show you also on the expand too, is by using uh, a, con a controller. So this little thing here, you don't need to get one of these. We can, we're going to do this manually. This is a cheap uh, Korg Nano control too. It was like 40 bucks or something like that. And I've programmed it, and notice I've put little little labels on it so that I know what every one of these knobs does. And for example, uh, let me show you something. I, I can use, last semester I was using this to change scenes on the OBS software um, that I was using to get like uh, different cameras and all this stuff. Uh, I am using this, this box now, which is much better. But for example, if I take the console from my audio interface, which is this here, and this is my microphone. Now you might still hear it because Zoom might go before this mixer, but I'm going to push this button here and you're going to see this get white. It's going to be mute. So I'm sending out MIDI control change and it's telling that to mute my microphone, which, like I said, I'm not sure whether that's happening on Zoom, but I definitely don't hear it anymore in my headphone. So how do you do that if you don't have one of these little controllers? Well, there's a couple of ways. So let's open this up. Right? And right here, we've got our lane. This this whole area, these are edit, you know, edit lanes, L-A-N-E-S, like lanes on a highway. This box with the little downward facing triangle means that there are more functionality down there. So if I click here, 
right, you're going to see that there's a list with a bunch of different functions. You got MIDI volume, MIDI mute, MIDI pan, MIDI pitch bend, mono aftertouch, program change, sysx. We're not going to work, learn about sysx or program change. I don't. I have. I haven't used sysx since 1994 or two or three. Um, it's. I, I think it's. It's still function useful, but not for anything that we would be doing. And then controllers, mod wheel, breath control, foot control, expression, and sustain. And there are, you can also, at the bottom here, it says, let me get this up so I can zoom in. And so these are all for MIDI and this is for audio, right? We're not work worried about this right now. Uh, we'll be doing that later in the semester and we won't be doing it from down here. So if we can see here, it says add and remove controllers. So if I click here, a whole other list comes up and you'll notice it, it only go, Pro Tools only goes up to 119. It should be going up to 127, but Pro Tools is cheap. So seriously, so you can add any of these, right? And the I'll show you why these are important in a minute, but let's not worry about that at the moment. What we want to do is we're going to go to something called expression, and that is in this little box on the side. So let me zoom in, get this in the middle and zoom in so you can see it. All right, so I click on this box. We're, we're going to leave MIDI volume alone. We're going to go down here and we're going to go to controllers and we're going to pick, whoops, hold on, let me zoom out. I'm expression, which has parentheses 11. Right, MIDI CC11 is expression. MIDI CC1 is the mod wheel. MIDI CC7 is a MIDI MIDI volume. MIDI CC10, I believe, is pan. Yep, 64 is your sustain pedal. Okay, so MIDI expression, right? So. It starts off at 127. It starts off at full full volume, but what I can do here, and let me let's see. Oh, let me make this the right size. No wonder I'm getting confuzzled here. Is I can use my pencil tool, and I'm gonna I, I I'm counseling you guys to start out. For the first couple of assignments, just using the, the straight line. And then if you want to do freehand, and we are going to work with triangle, square, and random in the future. But if you, you want to just get just learn how to do this with the straight line, it's a little bit easier than trying to draw with the freehand. You you can go to the freehand maybe on the next assignment, but like just practice a little bit with the straight line. I'm going to zoom in and notice I've and I'm going to just do something like this. Oh, freehand, straight line. So I'm going to crescendo in, right? And then I'm going to do a, a slow crescendo down and then fade, a little fade out here. So let's take a listen. My notes disappeared. Nina. Right, so let's do it a little bit more dramatically so you can hear it. Right, so you can, you can hear that the, the volume changes. So I might leave it like that, right? And the cello, I got expression here, so maybe I want to do like a crescendo up to here. And then take crescendo here. And then a crescendo up to there. Let's take a listen. And let's just solo the cello and violin one. 
So uh, we need to do something with violin too. So we'll do a decrescendo here with violin too. And these you'll have to adjust and listen and make sure you got what sounds best. Oh, and with the viola, let's do a crescendo up with the viola. Right? So we'll just solo the strings. Right? So you can hear that there's, vo there's, there's animation, there's volume changing there. And it... it it adds a lot of life. So let's take a listen to our, our oboe. And we'll click here. And we'll get the oboe up. And we'll do, uh, we will get rid of velocity. And we'll just have expression. So... Let's get this bigger so you can see everything. And hit return. We're back at the beginning. What if I wanted to do a little crescendo up to that top note there? A little too dramatic, right? You can hear that I did, that's not right. And then maybe we'll do a crescendo up to here and a day crescendo down. Right? You can see that there's much more life to this right now. And let's look at our clarinet. And maybe we'll do this with the clarinet. We'll do something that looks a little bit like that. And we'll solo that and hear what that sounds like with the... And then we'll do a crescendo up here like this. And then a little day crescendo. You can't see that because I'm in the way. Let's get rid of me. Right. And... Let's get our bassoon in there. And then maybe the same thing with the bassoon. We're going to crescendo up to our little solo area. And we'll do the same thing with the flute here. Right. I can do these really quickly because I, you know, <laughs> I've been doing this for years. But I'll still have to adjust it. And then the oboe is too soft in that one spot there. horn ba bee boo ba I have made this a little bit longer <laughs> I have to hear how that sounds in context I'll leave it for now trumpet Now, with the bass, it's doing those pizzicatos, right? This you would adjust pretty much with velocity because it's, it, it's mostly with sustained notes that we were, we're doing that expression and that uh, to change the volume. Now, you, ask, may, you might ask me, why are you using expression instead of MIDI volume? And why are you not using audio volume? What I like to do is, uh, if I'm playing an organ, right, any organ player, 
makes the organ speak by using the expression pedal, right? That's the proper term for it, not the volume pedal, the expression pedal. Right, Dylan? That's right. Yeah. So um, I've transferred that into this study. And what I use the MIDI volume for is as an additional overall level. So let's say I like the shape that I've done with my expression, but the whole thing is a little bit too loud. I just can bring down the MIDI volume a little bit or bring it up a little bit to fine tune it. And you'll find that as we go on through the semester, there are several ways to do that. There's ways to do that with audio groups where I use something called a VCA master to sort of fine tune the overall volume of a section of instruments. And it just, you know, the more control that you have and you assign to your, to your work, the better it will sound, right? Because you'll be able to fine tune and adjust things. And it's like you're a chef and you're putting things in and you're tasting it a little bit and, oh, I need a little bit more of this. So oh, that I put too much of that. How do I counteract that? Or if you're a painter, well, there's too much of this yellow over here. Let me make that a little bit darker by adding some ochre in there. Or, or if, uh, you know, it's too dark down here, let me contrast that with something a little bit lighter over here, light and shade. And you're sort of constantly fine tuning things. And, you know, there are, all these controls exist for for a reason you know you sort of are are there and they help you to create um something that's not just a word document a text a text file you know it has life it has movement it has animation and even with these you know subpar samples on this particular assignment it still sounds pretty good and it sounds pretty good because of the work that was done to make the notes the proper length, the work that was done on the velocity of the notes, and the work that, was, that we're doing with the orchestration and not having sort of, I like to have a kaleidoscope, my orchestrational approach. I like to spread things around, especially with MIDI instruments. It sort of masks the fact that they're not real instruments. And... You know, it's sort of like this, I, I talk about, there's a, a Fred Wellesley tune, Pass the Peas, right? Pass the Peas, Pass the Peas. And um, it's the same thing with orchestrational techniques. I'm passing content and lines around and things are moving and they're animated. And I find that if you, I got that technique by spending 30 years playing in shows, right? When I was playing in... Uh, Phantom of the Opera, I listened to the orchestrations and how that, I forget what the name of the orchestrator there was. Uh, and same thing with Les Mis, but when I was playing at Miss Saigon, they, Bill Braun, you know, one of the great orchestra, uh, Broadway orchestrators of the 1980s, the 1990s, he would, you know, he would be constantly shifting who was playing the counter lines behind the melody. It was just, it was just this wild, you know, distribution of all the notes and it sort of helped things move along, you know? It, it just sort of gives an animation and a motor to the music. And it stops it from being boring. Yes, there are times where you're going to have the long line written out for the soloist or the vocalist or or stuff, but if you listen to, like, Nelson Riddle's incredible orchestrations for Frank Sinatra, you know, like... Yeah, the strings are playing long lines and stuff, but just listen. It's like all these different instruments coming in and different when they're doing a count, like an answering line for uh, a, a, a melodic piece. Well, the first verse, it's orchestrated a certain way. And then the second verse, it's the same music pretty much, but it's orchestrated with a different group of instruments. And things build as you get towards cadences. And then they, you know, that helps you go on the turnaround back into the top of the form. And so, you know, just all these things that you want to build in to your arrangements and your orchestrations, and then they'll really help your, your stuff grow. So, um, yeah, one more time. Let me listen to this. All right, so what I want to do now is everybody, you know, any questions on these techniques that I'm showing you here, right? They, they're, they're not, that's not rocket science. It, you should be able to copy and paste. Um, you know, look, you can also, remember when I did that option shift thingy? Well, let's say I, I got this line here 
and I want to move it uh, to the viola, right? So if I just highlight that area, right? So I just clicked here, held the shift key down and highlighted this area here. If I do command and the letter E, that separates that out into its own region, right? Or its own little clip. So I can highlight that, hold the option key, and then just drag that straight down to the viola. And it still says horn. Well, I can double click on, oh, I'm sorry. I can right click on that and rename it. But now I've right. I've got that in there, so you know that's just you can do that inside of um, inside the edit window instead of going to the MIDI editor. You can do the same uh, option, uh, click drag. All right. So what I want to do now is I want to show you a little bit about animate more about animation, and we're just going to spend about fifteen minutes looking at this other track. This is called The Cat's Eye, and it's from one of my albums. I think it's from First Light or Road Home. I forget. Do we have any way to automate properties of our plugins? Do we have a way to automate properties of our plugins in one of the lanes? Uh, no, no. I'm going to be showing you that. Um, no, that's a different. That's in a different spot. All right. Uh, yes, yes, it's in one of the lanes, but you have to add it, and that'll be part of the next assignment. All right, uh, thank you. So, Noam is asking if you, uh, I don't have any plug, like, let's say I've got this is a mix of this track, right? So, let's say I've got this plug in right here, and if I wanted to automate a parameter of this, I would have to click on this right here and then uh, add that in, hit OK, and then there'll be a lane that shows up for that um, here, right there. And then that, so this is audio. It's a little different than what we were doing with MIDI. We're not here yet though. So let me play you a little bit of this and I'm going to show you some of the things that I've done here. to that. Here we go. So now just to show you some of those techniques I was talking about, right? So I've 
I've got two pianos at the beginning. I've got this this piano here. And if I see how I've got volume automation, this is audio, so it's going to be a little bit different than MIDI, but you could see how I'm bringing the volume up. And additionally, if you look at the waveform, you can see that It's starting off with not a lot of as much height here as it is over here. So the, the the audio, the track is getting louder, and I'm also it was recorded so that it crescendos, and I also goose that a little bit more with automation, right? So so I've got this little piano, like a, just a straight piano here, with kind of like Debussy chords, right? They're yeah, kind of like drop two voicings. And then I'm doubling that though with a, vo with a choir. But notice how the choir is not going da, 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 da. It's going da, da, da. Why is that? Because it's a synthesized choir and I don't want it, and I have to mask that fact. And it would sound like it just. It, it doesn't sound, this sounds better. Just, I tried it both ways. And this is just years of experience where, you know, you're masking it and I'm creating an aggregate sound between the piano and the choir. And now light cymbals come in right there. And now the second time the voice comes in, I mean, the melody. The second time the melody comes in, I have these two acoustic guitars. So I've got, on the left, I've got my... That's really soft. Let me bring the... Uh, There we go. Right, and then that's doubled and played and panned the other direction. So I'm playing that on a big jumbo uh, guild. So not, notice how that fits in nicely with the piano. And then I still have the choir this time with the piano. But I add some bells, right? So the next time through, I've got all these other elements. This is similar to what I was talking about. And then the drums change. So the first first, they're playing the second half of the first first. There's just that little cymbal stuff. And then when verse two starts... keeping more of a steady time, right? And then the other thing too that happens is that I've got this fill with the, the bass starts playing and it's um, a fretless bass. And let me just play the piano and the bass. And you can see that I'm filling in this space here with the bass line. Actually, now that I think about it, that's a sampled bass layered with um, my mini mode back there, right? I keep I can't remember. I did this so long ago. And then when the chorus starts, the drum kits changes. Right. So it's just all just just how that unfolds. It's a very simple sounding. Uh, opening to that piece but again it's it's just the way that you orchestrate things i think that add a lot of the interest you know you got the foundation of the piece and the way that you orchestrate it and the way that things layer and unfold and i want you to start working not doing 
I'd like for your 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 work to start right from the beginning. It doesn't have to be as detailed as this or just do the best you can. I'm more interested that you start in with these concepts and over the course of the semester, you start growing and adding them and they get more and more fluent fluent in your repertoire of orchestration. And, and the last thing I want to say too about for today is that you know, as I've mentioned a few times, I spent over 30 years of my life as one of the busiest keyboard players in New York City, right? Big shows, Carnegie Hall with New York Pops, Radio City Orchestra, uh, tours. I played with Aretha Franklin, Don Cherry, Allen Ginsberg. I did all sorts of playing. The more of this stuff I did, the better I got as a musician, performing musician, because it started teaching me to listen to more than just myself as a player. You know, how many notes can I play in this spot? And, or, you know, always, I always fit in with the rhythm section. I always knew how to do that. But once I started getting to these orchestral situations, it, it, it took me a while to feel comfortable with them. But the more I started learning about orchestration and um, how a song or a piece of music is structured and how the orchestrations help to define that structure and help to unfold the piece, the story, all that stuff, I started being able to play the story better. Not move my hands faster on the keyboard, but actually make better music. You know, so this is technology, but your technology can have a reverse effect and make you a better musician as a performer as well. If you learn from 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 what you're doing, you pay attention and you sit back and you say, oh, the piano, you know, I shouldn't be so loud here because that guy has the focus. It's not all about me. I'm just supposed to be a support here. And then in this two measures, I got to fill. So let me really dig in and and stick that out right there with the two measures and then get back right into the being the accompanist. You know, so these are things that, you know, that you, you, you learn from doing. Right. And, uh, you know, you should always be learning as a musician, no matter how old you are. So um, I will send out an email in the morning with the exact instructions for the assignment and uh, just do as much as you can of this next week. I'd like for you guys to at least get through the pieces, but I want to put this to bed and move forward uh, with another assignment next week because we're already at week six next week and we have a lot, a lot, a lot to do still. Any questions on this? A lot of information today. Hopefully I'll get this review video up um, probably tomorrow. And it'll be live, so you'll be able to review any of this stuff. Any questions today before we go? Uh, professor? Yes. Um, what is it? I was just curious because you said we could uh, take liberties, of course, with um, changing the notes on the Bartok piece. I'm kind of curious. Like, you know, for me, I, I heard that oboe sound, and it, it, like, you know, sounds a little shrill. I don't know if, like, it's okay to mess a little bit around if we know what we're doing, like maybe compression or... No, a no, EQ. not with that. No? But okay. Here, let me show you what you can do. Okay. No, I don't want, I don't want you to do that yet. So, um, all right, hold on. Let me open up that last piece. Okay, and I was going to, I was going to start working with this next week anyway, so I can show you today. You could also use the BBC Discover oboes. So let's see. Okay, so let me solo the oboe. It is a little shrill. You can go right here and you could turn the cutoff down a little. Because compression is not going to make that uh, less shrill. All right, so I, I don't want to have any plugins yet. I want to I want to exp unfold this in an orderly way, but um, I was going to go over these next week as part of more. You can automate these as well. Um, yeah. So this is part of what Gnome said, and there's also more stuff over here that you could automate. I mean, it's insane how much stuff you can automate in all. And this 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 stuff works with every DAW. So just turn the cutoff down if it's too sharp. Uh, I was going to show you how to do something like that. Let me just show you for a second here with, before we go. So let's say that... Um, let 
let's take the viola right here. Uh, hold on. Oh, actually, this doesn't work with the viola because I'm using the BBC SO. So let's see. Let's change that to expand two and just pop in a string. Um, so I'm just doing any strings here, right? So, so what I can do with this is I can, and I'm going to show you this in more detail next week. So if I right click here, it says, forget MIDI CC72. What that means is that you can control this with MIDI CC72. So what I would do is um, I'd open up the MIDI editor. I go here and I'd add controllers and then I'd go to 72. I would add that and then go back here and then 72 is there. So let's see, I can start off darker and make this brighter and you'll see this is going to move. Oh, that's release. That's the wrong one. Whoops. Cut off is 74. My mistake. My mistake. It's 74. So let's just add 74. And let's remove that other one. Great. Okay, so let's go back here. Let's go to 74. And let's do this. And I'll start off dark and get bright, right? Right, you saw that this knob moves, right? And that kind of simulates more of what uh, a real fiddle player would do. But we'll get into that next week. But if you just, you know, you can, if you can figure that out, you can add that in for sure. But uh, I would just, if it's too shrill, just turn the, the, the cutoff frequency down. All right. That's it for today. I'm exhausted. And uh, it's hard to talk for two and a half, two hours and 10 minutes straight. Any questions? All right. Have a good week, everyone. I will give you feedback um, over by the weekend for your uh, written assignment. And I will get the review video up and the instructions tomorrow morning for the, for the next part of this assignment. And we're going to finish this up and move on. Have a great afternoon, evening, a great weekend, and I will catch you guys next week. Thank you for being here. Thank you, uh, Professor. Thank you. Yep. Hey, Professor. Thank, thank you. you. Catch you later. Thank you.